so let me, uh, let me introduce myself instead of just the guy uh, telling jokes up on stage. Uh, my name is Derek Carter. Uh, I work for Procore. Uh, I've been a web developer for about 20 years, um, and I've been a Rails developer since 2008. Uh, and uh, this picture uh, was, took, was taken by a colleague of mine uh, and is from our office. I kid you not. Uh, I love our office. I take a walk out here every single afternoon. Um, but uh, uh, for some of you uh, who caught uh, John's talk yesterday, you know a little bit about the history uh, of Procore. Uh, but what we are is uh, cloud-based construction management software. Uh, we, as our tagline says that I really love, we build the software that builds the world. And uh, I'm uh, up here today to tell you guys about uh, an endeavor that Procore did in 2016 uh, and on into this year, which is uh, Procore decided to really double down and build out a, a complete API across all of our projects and our applications and our tools. Uh, to give you a sense of what that uh, endeavor uh, entailed, I, I want to talk a little bit about the guts of Procore for a second. Um, Procore has, uh, we're growing like crazy. Uh, last count, I think we have over 700 employees, um, about 120 engineers, probably more than that. Uh, and at least 22 squads. Uh, these are probably old figures. Um, our Rails app is over 10 years old. We have over 40 distinct tools, and each tool is basically an application unto itself. And we have over 500 controllers in our application. Procore is big. Our application is big. It's all a Rails app. It's, it's huge. Forget majestic monolith. We are a majestic uberlith. I actually thought this would be a great name for a metal band. <laughs> but uh, beyond that, uh, we, we uh, operate with squads. And uh, something that Procore really believes in is autonomy, not just at the squad level, but at the personal level. We really believe that uh, we should give direction to people and let them use their experience and their knowledge to get us where we need to go. So uh, we, we strongly believe in that idea of autonomy, which is something with, that uh, we tell to every new hire. It's a strong part of our, our culture, and it's something that we believe very strongly in. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about that autonomy. We follow the uh, Spotify squad model. Uh, essentially, we break up our, uh, our R&D department into squads that each have a product manager, a UX designer, a QA, and a handful of engineers. And these squads have an ownership of uh, certain tools um, that they have basically full control over. They have a product ownership over. Uh, they, they choose the direction of that product. They choose what to work on next. Uh, it's that autonomy idea. Um, and if you guys aren't familiar with the squad model, squads roll up into tribes. Uh, and then for uh, things that go across squads for common interests, uh, we roll up into guilds. Uh, an example of a few guilds that we have at Procore is we have a front end guild that uh, takes on a lot of the front end concerns and how we make decisions there, a performance guild that uh, keeps an eye on our performance and how we're doing on our controllers and our database. And we have a, even have a guild for master failures with uh, application as large as we have. We have a lot of errant uh, failures just from machine hiccups. Um, so we have uh, this model that uh, has, we have at least 22 squads, right, each owning their own tools on a big application. Uh, and we have to make a consistent effort to make one large API across the entire application. How do we do that without it feeling like we're herding cats? Well, it wasn't always a smooth and perfect ride, but we got there. And I'll show you, uh, spoiler, this is the end result. We've got a full, consistent, uh, beautiful API. I think it's beautiful, um, you know, but you know, uh, kind of like I'm a mom here, but uh, <laughs> we, we, we essentially accomplished what we set out to do. Um, but before I get into how we did that, I want to talk a little bit about why we did that. Why did Procore uh, double down and invest uh, in an API? Well, there's a lot of benefits to building out an API like this, uh, both internal, which relates to your developer happiness or your code health, uh, and also external, which is you know, relating to your uh, customer happiness and your sales health. Um, one internal benefit that you can get is uh, building an API forces a natural separation of concerns. You now have essentially your uh, API layer separate from your view layer. Uh, and that uh, forces modular architecture. And that modular architecture is innately cleaner architecture. 
Um, another internal benefit that we get is change tolerance. If uh, we get, uh, as uh, DHH I think says, a new Rails framework every three months. But if you build a uh, good, consistent, uh, well-designed API, it can last through several iterations of different uh, uh, JavaScript frameworks or front ends. You can replace that at any time or you can integrate with any system and your API remains relatively the same. I like the analogy of uh, TV. We've had televisions in our living rooms for almost a century now. And the API for how a television gets its power, essentially the power plug, has remained the same even though uh, our televisions uh, have drastically changed shape. Uh, so when you design it well, you can, uh, it can last for a while. Uh, one big external benefit is uh, that APIs engender customer trust. If a customer is looking at different products and it looks at your product and has a well-maintained API, it makes them comfortable knowing they can get their data in and out of your system easily, that's gonna really help close the deal. And it's gonna really help uh, engender that trust between you and the customer before they've even engaged with you. Um, another is that uh, an API can greatly expand your capabilities. When you empower other people, integrators, developers, or just people who are interested in your business space to build on your platform, you can greatly expand what your application can do without spending any extra resources. And when that works, and that works well, and I think it works well at Procore, you get to become the ecosystem. You now have fostered an entire uh, ecosystem of applications that work on your platform and, uh, and everything just works nice and you get to enjoy and reap the benefits of that. So, uh, we've talked about the benefits, but let's talk a little bit about, well, what makes a good API? You know, when we're starting this endeavor, what's kind of the end goal that we wanna look for? Well, a good API is predictable and consistent. Developers don't want to have to write new code for every endpoint you surface. You, uh, and especially, this compounds the fact when you think about developing SDKs for your application, the more inconsistent your endpoints are, the uh, more code and the more cruft is gonna be introduced trying to take on those endeavors. A good API is static. If your API changes in a breaking way, congratulations, you've now just broken everything that is integrating with it. Uh, one joke that, uh, that I really like is, writing an API is like sex. Make one mistake and you're stuck supporting it the rest of your life. Uh, a, good, a good API is also simple and clear. Uh, and a, writing an API is not the time to be clever or show how good you are at writing code. Uh, an API should give back exactly what somebody expects it to, nothing more and nothing less. A good API is also flexible. Uh, and this may seem right at first glance that it conflicts with the second point of that, how can it be both flexible and static? But think about steel, right? The way you make steel not break is make it flexible. And that's the same thing with an API. So we talked about what a good API should look like. Now let's talk about how we actually did it. How did we build this big, beautiful beast? Well, it wasn't easy. It wasn't always easy and it wasn't always pretty. There was a lot of discussion, there was a lot of arguments. We have a lot of really smart and talented engineers at Procore and, and some of them have different ways and different views on how to do things. So there was a lot of arguments, there was a lot of style discussions, there was a lot of architecture discussions, there was a lot of uh, conflicting ideas and a lot of uh, like really passionate arguments. But one thing that it boils down to and something that uh, Jeff Bezos says that I really buy into is disagree and commit. You know, you're always going to have those kind of things that it seems like an impasse, but somebody's just gotta give, and you've just gotta, for the sake of productivity, decide, okay, we're gonna go with this. I don't think it's the right way, I believe it's this way, but I'm gonna commit to this decision and be behind us 100% uh, on this. So I wanna step back a little second um, and tell you a little bit about what we did to the squad model at Procore. Uh, a few things, uh, new endeavors that we're doing that really help this endeavor. Um, one of the things we've added is the idea of what I like to call guide squads. Um, a guide squad is essentially a squad that doesn't necessarily own its own tools, but really owns the process or uh, things that stretch across other squads. It's like a guild, but with more ownership. Uh, for example, I am on the API squad uh, at Procore. And whereas I don't write a lot of the endpoints, those are owned by the uh, developers who own the specific tools. Uh, 
we act as kind of a shepherd to the uh, API development process, uh, helping uh, you know, to make people disagree and commit and to come up with those decisions that are really important to keeping uh, up our productivity. So uh, what does that mean? Like, What do we do as a squad and how do we help this endeavor? Uh, well, one, as uh, Steve Krug famously says, don't make your developers think on things that don't matter to them. That's a big one. Uh, one of the biggest questions uh, that I get uh, at Procore is, uh, you know, well, should I do this or this? And uh, it doesn't matter to them. They just want to know how to be consistent with the rest of the application. Uh, so we want to make sure that they're not having to think about these problems uh, for things that they don't care about so they can get to the problems that they do care about, like their tools and their endpoints. Uh, so one, way is, one of the ways that we solve this is have a style guide. It goes back to the Rails concept of convention over configuration. Um, we, uh, we at Procore take this and, uh, and we've built a style guide for our API and we have style guides for a lot of our different uh, sections of our application. Um, now I, I, I wanna make sure that to know that you don't have to have a style guide planned out all in advance. As a matter of fact, I think that's probably a very bad idea because you don't know what those decisions are all at once. Uh, but what I encourage you to do is uh, keep a wiki or some kind of way that every time a question get, comes up and you answer it, you write it down. It's very important that you write it down because you can't come to a decision and then walk away and the next day how many times it's like, uh, wait, what did we decide there? Like write it down and then after a while, guess what, you've got a style guide. Uh, ours looks kind of like this. This is just a small section of it. Um, we, we like to keep things as pretty as we can. Uh, so it's, it's kind of formatted. Uh, but uh, just this really, really helps, especially for new developers who get on our application uh, and start writing APIs to have a lot of questions answered before they have to go and talk to another developer. Uh, another key thing is boilerplate and examples. Because let's be honest, when, you're, when we're uh, writing code, we're copying a lot already anyways, right? So let's my, might as well make sure that we get the source as close to what we want the end to look like as possible if we know what that should be. Uh, <laughs> so here's, here's a scenario that, I'm, uh, that you guys may run into. We did a lot. Uh, let's say you've got a developer writing an API. So he starts hammering away writing that API and then you've got your front end developer who's uh, there just waiting on that API or this is, could be your mobile team or your, or your integrators, whatever. Uh, and finally, okay, he's done with the API, he ships it over, all right, we've got it, we can start working. But then he realizes, oh no, it doesn't have half the things I really need. Uh, and uh, so then the back-end developer goes back and he's, he's hammering on the API, he's adding all those scenarios and, and he sh finally ships it to the front-end developer and the front-end developer celebrates and then the product manager goes, oh wait, uh, we have customers who really need it to do this, this, and this. And then you're back to, right to the beginning again. Uh, so how do, you, how do you subvert that process? How do you get rid of that? Because you don't want people, you don't want developers ever waiting, right? You want to be productive. Well, one of the big things that we do is, uh, is we make contracts, API contracts. And uh, it, for those of you who don't know, an uh, API contract is just essentially an agreement between your stakeholders about what that uh, API is going to look like when it's finished. Uh, in our case, we just use JSON files. Uh, and an example would be something like this. Uh, this would be for a simple to-do list application, which we love in the Rails community, right? Uh, and uh, we just, we pass these around and we get agreement and buy-in and uh, the, the front-end developers, your mobile developers, your integrators can look at this and go, okay, this has all the attributes I need or I need this, this, and this. So you can cut through that conversation a lot faster. And not only that, but when you've made that decision and you've all committed to the central contract, then your front-end developers can start developing against it while your back-end developers start writing tests against it. And you, they develop and they come to the middle and they, exa they know exactly what the middle looks like. And it works and it in empowers that parallel development. So uh, I wanna go back to talk a little bit about uh, building static APIs flexibly. Um, because we found that there, there were a lot of times where we were building endpoints that uh, didn't actually meet the customer's needs. And sometimes you can't get contracts out to that, right? Sometimes it's not feasible to figure out all the things that your endpoint needs to do ahead of time. So one of the things that we do at Procore is that we introduce the idea of support levels for our APIs. Uh, essentially, we call them uh, alpha, beta, and production. 
And uh, a lot of times, if a developer is writing an API for a tool, but he's not sure that it meets all the needs of the stakeholders, and he's not able to write a contract for it, uh, he will make, mark that as beta, and the internal uh, customers or the um, external customers who want to jump on these beta programs can come in with the full knowledge that uh, this could change and these are kind of up in the air, and then they provide that feedback, right, that, that we really want from a product perspective. And what that does is that takes that process, which is instead of just like uh, putting up steel, but more like pouring concrete, where you have a little time to massage it uh, after it's poured before it sets. And that's essentially what we do. And once we have the, all of that feedback, then we promote it to production, and uh, we've got our new endpoint. Um, another important uh, point, uh, and I'm going to dive into this, is use reusable components. There is, it is impossible, in my opinion, to build a consistent application without building some common components. Uh, so let's go back to our to-do list app. Right? This is uh, just a simple index action for a single to-do list to return the items. But let's say we now have a uh, product requirement that we need to be able to filter this endpoint to whether the items are completed or not. Well, it may look something like this, right? Um, that's a lot of code. We're, we're, uh, you know, we're stepping through this. Uh, it's not the prettiest, right? But this, is, this could happen. Uh, but now think about this. This is just one filter on one endpoint. And we have over 500 controllers in our application. We have a lot of tools. It's very big. Suddenly, your, your code, uh, your application is now just full of cruft. Uh, and it's everywhere. So how, do, how did we solve that? Well, we built a uh, gem that we call filterable. And uh, we include that uh, on our controllers. And it's a really simple, really nice interface. Uh, you just include the concern. And then you can say, filter on uh, your attribute and you can give it a type to validate against. And so now you have filter validations for free as well. Uh, this means this is much cleaner code, much more readable, um, and, uh, and it moves all the complicated bits to a, a central location that's, uh, that you can provide full testing around. And not only that, but the most importantly, all of your endpoints across your entire application now filter exactly the same way. So, all, so you've gained all of that consistency for very little cost. Uh, we've also expanded it to uh, support sorting, um, and, uh, and it also uh, provides data types, as well as scopes if you need more complex filters. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, we're going to be releasing this uh, gem as open source to the Rails community. Uh, so let's, uh, another very important part of developing APIs is serialization. In my experience, that's been one of the biggest performance costs for APIs. Um, it's a constant problem, and it's where a lot of uh, people in, new to uh, API development really struggle with. Um, we found uh, we were using JBuilder for a while, but uh, JBuilder is very flexible, but it's not, uh, it didn't have the performance requirements that we needed, and we found that it didn't really serve our, uh, our needs in terms of organization. So we went with uh, Active Model Serializer which we found to be, uh, for our instance, a better organized, a bit more extensible, and faster. Um, uh, for those of you who aren't aware, Active Model Serializers is a uh, gem supported natively in the uh, Rails application. Um, you just throw it in your gem file, and uh, you can implement a serializer just like this. You uh, explicitly list out your attributes, and it also supports relationships. And if those relationships have serializers, it supports those as well, right out of the box. And the beauty of this is because it's supported in Rails, you don't even have to change your controller code. If it sees a uh, serializer with the same name as your model, it'll automatically use that, and you get the benefits of it right away. A sample output for a, that serializer you just saw would be this. Um, you can see the attributes there. Um, you can see that it included the association. Uh, it's just, it's nice, it works. Um, but let's, uh, let's add another endpoint to our API. In this case, we're adding a show endpoint. Now, uh, for one thing, uh, we don't always want to show all uh, fields on uh, our API endpoint, right? All the fields on the model. That's something that we can get from uh, modifying it in the Active Model Serializer, but what if you need different fields for different endpoints, like a show versus an index? 
Well, Active Model Serializer supports that uh, through passing in flags like fields and includes for attributes and relationships, respectively. Uh, the thing is, I don't really like this design paradigm. Uh, I, I feel like this is too much uh, putting view logic in your controller where I don't think it belongs. Not only that, it's really hard to keep consistent across different uh, API endpoints. So uh, what we did was we extended the uh, active model serializer, which is just really easy in Rails. You just inherit from it. Uh, it's just like uh, application controller. You can think about it the same way. And uh, we built an application serializer, which uh, what it does for us is allow us to uh, create views in active model serializer itself. And so those would look like this. Your, your serializer would now look like this. You have your standard attributes at the top, and those would be included every time that uh, record is serialized. But now you have uh, explicitly named view blocks where you can wrap uh, attributes and relationships in those and uh, call those views from anywhere, uh, from any controller, just like this. So now, with a one-line change and one serializer, uh, you can now support two different views, and even more so beyond that. Uh, it has really helped us be consistent, and it, uh, one of the problems we were running into is that the, the solutions before this were creating multiple serializers, um, trying different serialization methods for different parts, and this just uh, makes it all consistent and all one. Uh, and that output would uh, look like this. Nice and easy, uh, very few lines of code that you need to mess with, and best of all, the developers who were using it didn't have to think much about how they were doing it. They just got to the part that they wanted to get to, which is how do I get these attributes on this uh, endpoint? So um, before we, uh, another part of uh, building APIs, and one of the things that I think is almost the most important is documenting the API. Because I'm, I'm not gonna mince words here, an undocumented API is a worthless API, okay? Um, documentation is like sex. When it's good, it's very good. But when it's bad, it's still better than none at all. <laughs> Documenting your API cannot stress enough how important this is. No matter how you do it, just do it. Uh, we started out documenting our API uh, with wikis and markdown. And this is actually a great way to get your documentation spun up. Uh, because it's really easy, there's low barrier to entry. A lot of developers know how wikis work, how, uh, they know Markdown. Uh, it really gets everybody in the same place writing these APIs. And it looks, and it comes out pretty nice, right? Like, uh, you know, the wikis and the Markdown can uh, really just work. But the problem is, you go from this nice, well-maintained house of all of your nice-looking documentation, and then you sprinkle in a little time. And perhaps you add a new endpoint and somebody to, forgets to update the documentation. Perhaps there's a bug that they fix and they don't even think about updating the documentation. And then you compound that across all of our applications and all of our tools and you add time and you quickly go from this nice, beautiful, well-maintained mansion to a dilapidated mess. So how do, you, how do we prevent that? Like how do we not make that happen? Well, there's a, several ways, but the way that we chose to do it at Procore is with Swagger. Uh, AKA the Open API specification. Um, and if you're not aware what Swagger is, which a lot of people aren't, is uh, it is basically just a specification for describing uh, RESTful APIs. Uh, in our case, uh, it's, we, we write our uh, Swagger in YAML, but it supports YAML or JSON. Um, here's a JSON example straight from their website. Uh, it, it just basically describes all of your endpoints, all of their parameters, everything that is technical about your um, API endpoints. And this gives us a lot of benefits. For one, it's a guided structure. We're at RailsConf. I'm assuming everybody here likes opinionated frameworks. Uh, if you're not, you're, if you don't, you're probably in the wrong place. Uh, and Swagger is definitely an opinionated framework, but that helps a lot because it goes back to don't make your developers think. They follow the Swagger spec and all, and they have nice APIs. Uh, Swagger also encourages you to separate your style and content. This is a paradigm we've learned, uh, we've known in the web development world for a long time now, right? You don't want your documentation content and your style to be the same because if you update your style, well, that's a huge endeavor, right? Uh, and this is just uh, basically machine code and CSS. Uh, it's nice. Uh, 
uh, one of the biggest benefits of Swagger is that it's machine readable because it's just JSON. So you can do things like it's uh, tested, it's lintable. Uh, one of the coolest things you can do with Swagger is auto-generate SDKs. Uh, it's true, there's a whole lot of tools uh, that, that take the Swagger and do really cool things with it. I encourage you to check those out. It's kind of beyond the scope of this talk, but it is really neat. But that's not to say that it's all roses. There are problems with Swagger. One of the biggest is, well, it's another damn thing to learn, right? Uh, it's, it's not always easy. Not all developers know the JSON spec, uh, so they have to learn that, and then they have to learn the, the specific uh, parts of the Swagger spec. So there is a bit of a learning curve. But we've found that the, uh, that the benefits greatly outweighed the cost. So I want to talk about uh, our Swagger at Procore. Right, because remember, Procore is big. Our application is big. We've got a lot of things going on there. Uh, well, one of, you know, we follow a lot of the same paradigms writing documentation as we do writing the API. Basically providing style guides, um, having reusable components as often as we can, and that's another great thing about Swagger is you can reference other models uh, within your uh, Swagger specification so you don't have to keep rewriting uh, definitions all over the place. Um, but one of the problems that we ran into was that uh, with all of our endpoints and all of our APIs, our swagger was getting a little big. 7.7 uh, .7 megabytes big, which for a JSON file is kind of huge. Uh, we basically broke every uh, swagger renderer that we could find. Uh, so uh, with no other options, we basically wrote our own. Um, this is a, uh, an architecture diagram for our documentation generator. Uh, it runs uh, Ruby on AWS Lambda, which could be, I think, a talk unto itself. Um, but uh, it's, it's kicked off by our uh, continuous deployment uh, and our continuous integration hooks. Uh, and it creates static JSON that is ready to be renderable and read by humans, stores it on a, a CDN, and then our, uh, we have a React rendering uh, application that uh, for our documentation site that pulls down that JSON. So what it means in the end is that we have nice, beautiful documentation that's really, really fast. And it uh, goes across all of our endpoints, which, if I haven't said it yet, is huge. Uh, so uh, to kind of wrap up uh, and talk about uh, these aspects, uh, don't make your developers think. If I haven't said that enough, it's true. You don't want them to have to make decisions that they're not really, that they don't care about and they're not qualified to answer. Build a style guide for basically every endeavor because this goes back to the same thing. If you have questions already answered, developers don't have to think about it. Disagree and commit. This is huge. We're gonna get into arguments. We're smart, passionate developers. Be, always be uh, ready to essentially take the higher road and say, all right, we're gonna go with your plan. Uh, make contracts first. This is really important, this is, this is a lot of benefits. I don't think I have to harp on that because the first time you try it, you won't do it a different way after that. Use reusable components. I think that's just a general programming uh, paradigm in general, but it really uh, comes into building APIs. Use reusable components everywhere that you can. And for the love of God, document your damn API. No, nobody wants to use an undocumented API. I mean, nobody, not even internal developers. So please, please document it. Uh, all right, again, my name is Derek Carter. Uh, I work at Procore. I love working there. Uh, we're hiring like crazy. And uh, if you want uh, views like this, please, please talk to us. We'd love, we'd love to talk to you. Thank you. That's actually a great question. So the question was, do we have uh, basically internal routes that we don't want to expose to customers? Yes, lots. Um, and the way that we handle that is um, one of the things that I didn't talk about in relation to the support levels is that in our swagger, we have an X internal only flag. And so the um, API developers can put that uh, on their swagger documentation to mark the fact that that is an internal only uh, route. And uh, on our documentation rendering side, we use uh, LaunchDarkly to uh, essentially um, filter out those uh, features that, um, or those endpoints that uh, are internal, and so that we only surface them to those who are basically approved to do so, 
uh, like internal customers, and sometimes, um, you know, beta cust customers, but that's kind of rare. Oh, so the question was, is this uh, something that's basically Procore specific? Uh, right now, yes. Uh, it is because um, it's it's actually pretty new um, in, in our system and uh, and it's kind of uh, it, it was experimental but it's really really working out for us um, and so like I said this could be a no whole nother talk in it itself and I think maybe uh, that's something that we can uh, talk about because uh, you know we, we really want to talk about how how we've done things here and really uh, give back to the rails community in terms of these kind of things um, uh, speaking of which uh, also, going back to the application serializer, that uh, is going to be a PR into active model serializer uh, because I think that's uh, a pretty good value add there. So, uh, yeah, so he was uh, saying that uh, JBuilder makes it hard to share partials across, and we found that to be true as well. Um, as, as well, active model serializer allows you to call other serializers uh, either by name or implicitly by name, which is a huge value add to us. Oh, I see, I see. So um, the question was, if, uh, if the endpoint can look differently, um, essentially, uh, how, do we, how do we note that in the contracts? Well, uh, very low level, it's JSON, we can add comments, basically, and that's really uh, solved our problem. Uh, so the question was, the timeline on the filterable gem. Uh, actually, I don't know, but this, this gentleman right here, I think, probably does. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, so I, I see what you're saying, the timeline for release. Okay, sorry, uh, not, I, I apologize for putting you on the spot, Adam. Um, yeah, so the timeline for release, uh, it's actually uh, fully approved and it's ready to go. Uh, we just have to like cross our T's and dot our I's and then it's out. Yeah, basically. That's, that's a great question. Uh, the question is, do we write our Swagger documentation by hand or do we uh, generate it somehow from our controllers? Right now, it's all from hand. Um, just honestly, and the reason why, is because uh, our, uh, all, across all of our applications, we, it's a very old application, not everything is consistent, and so um, in, re in reality, the best, way to, uh, you know, the best way to do it right now is by hand, but we have explored lots of ways about how we're gonna do that going forward. Yeah, so, um, so the question was, how do we, how do we basically like, kind of gatekeep the swagger changes? Um, yeah, code review. It's all checked into our repo, um, and all swagger is code reviewed, we have, and we have tests and lint basically on our swagger. Well, thank you guys and enjoy the rest of your RailsConf.